Welcome to Combat Mission Red Thunder. Matrix Games Combat Mission Grand Tournament is kicking off, so we're going to have a look at the Dawn Patrol Tournament scenario. We're going to go over the terrain, the objectives and the forces for both sides, plus a few pointers on how to get the job done. Obviously, spoilers ahead. Tournament players will be tackling this scenario from both sides at once, so this video is going to reveal any surprises you might get if you play it on your own. The battle takes place at 0440 on June the 22nd, 1944, northwest of Vitebsk, and sees a Soviet reinforced rifle company attacking a German platoon plus position. So we have a Soviet attacker and a German defender. The map is roughly 900 meters long and 700 wide, and is almost entirely grassland. There are some woods, most notably along the German map edge and in the southeast corner on the Soviet side, but the vast majority of the map is open terrain. It's not flat though. It might look that way from up high, but when you get down towards ground level there are plenty of lumps, bumps and gullies that both sides can use for cover. This is a map that's really going to reward players who get the camera down in the dirt. The only other significant feature on the map is a dirt track running from east to west, though this is broken by a patch of mud just over halfway towards the German edge. Visibility is not great. At the start of the battle it's still dark and a line of sight cuts off at about 400 meters. The sun is rising though, so this will improve as time goes on by about 50 meters every 10 minutes, but there's also some light fog and rain to contend with which will make spotting difficult even inside visual range. The ground is wet, increasing the chances of vehicles bogging if they're off-road, and there is no wind, so any smoke either side decides to deploy will bloom in place rather than drifting about. There are 30 minutes on the clock with no variable extra time. Both sides have almost the same ground objectives, three successive lines of the German defence. These are the first line main line and reserve line for the Germans, and the first, second and third lines for the Soviets. The size and position of these objectives are very similar. The German objectives are generally longer and thinner, the Soviet ones are shorter and fatter. These are all Occupy objectives. To get the associated victory points you need to have exclusive control. That means the objective area has to be totally clear of enemy units. If there is one cowering enemy soldier tucked away in the objective area at the end of the game, it'll be contested and neither side will get the points. For the Germans, the first line is worth 670 victory points, with the main and reserve lines each worth 665 for a total of 2000. The Soviets are looking at 435 points for each ground objective, that's 1305 points altogether, and the remainder of their 2,000 points is filled out by some additional casualty and condition objectives. Casualty objectives are very straightforward. Every incapacitated individual soldier counts as a casualty. The Soviets will get 174 points for causing 33% casualties to the Germans, and another 174 points if they can keep their own losses below 33% as well. In terms of numbers for this game, there are 73 Germans on the field, so the Soviet player needs to cause about 25 casualties to get the points. To hit the other objective, there are 171 Soviets on the field, so the Soviet player needs to try and keep their own casualties under about 57. Condition objectives are a bit less transparent, but essentially relate to the capacity of the force to continue operations. Straight from the manual, condition is a combination of morale, fatigue, suppression and light wounds. This is a lot more difficult to judge than casualties, but there are 174 points on the table if the Soviets can keep their condition above 50% and another 174 points if they can bring the Germans down below 50% condition. Basically, the Soviet player is going to get a points boost if they can degrade the Germans without suffering too much in the process. The main aim for both sides is still going to be those ground objectives. So what forces have both sides got to get the job done? The Germans have the weaker force, a reinforced platoon. The core of this is a grenadier platoon with the Type 44A organisation, three nine-man squads and two Panzerschreck teams led by a four-man platoon HQ. 
The rifle squads are all about the MG42. That's where the squads are getting their firepower from. In terms of anti-tank capability, although there may be some Panzerfausts about, the much more reliable and important element is the two Panzerschreck teams. Attached directly to the platoon are two two-man light machine gun teams. These are up front in the default deployment, acting as outposts, which is a pretty good job for them. Moving up into the overarching company organization, the German player also has a machine gun section with a HQ and two tripod mounted MGs. If we're counting, and we are, that makes for seven machine guns so far. Also attached, we have a mortar platoon HQ from the battalion support company and a forward observer team. These two units are your best bet for directing your off-map support. A two-tube section of 81mm mortars with 100 rounds of high explosive will become available at the 5 minute mark. Finally, the platoon has a 50mm anti-tank gun attached. This is a Pac-38 supported by a 3-man platoon HQ and an ammo bearer team with another machine gun. The Pac-38 is a dedicated anti-tank gun. It has some high explosive ammo, but it's only a small shell, so don't expect much against infantry. Beyond the actual units, the Germans have a zoo of field fortifications. Five target reference points and a mix of foxholes, trench sections, sandbag corners, wire obstacles, anti-tank obstacles, and mines of various types. Target reference points let you call in fire quickly and without line of sight, but also function as known points for units on the map. So those MG teams or the Pac-38 will be able to get rounds on targets near TRPs much faster. The foxholes, trenches and sandbags offer some cover from fire. Wire obstacles are impassable to infantry and anti-tank obstacles are impassable to tanks. The anti-tank obstacles are also pretty much invincible. Wire obstacles can be crushed by vehicles or blown up by satchel charges. Finally, the mines come in anti-personnel, anti-tank and mixed flavours. Each minefield is an 8x8 eight eight meter square. So overall, we have a German defensive force that is really relying on machine guns and mortars with a fairly reasonable anti-tank capability and a pool of obstacles to exploit. The Soviets, meanwhile, have a much larger force. This is built around a 44-type rifle company with three platoons. Each platoon has three squads of 11 men, including two SMGs and a DP-27 light machine gun. Everybody else gets a Mosin the Gant 91-30 bolt action rifle, and each platoon also contains a sniper team of two marksmen equipped with scoped Mosin the Gants. There is no platoon HQ, the platoon leader heads up the first squad of each platoon. The company itself is led by a separate five-man headquarters, backed up by another sniper team and an SG-43 machine gun that wanted to be a tricycle when it grew up but couldn't quite make it. This rifle company makes up most of the Soviet manpower here, and it's best to think about it one level higher than you otherwise would. If you have a job for a fire team, send a squad. If you have a job for a squad, send a platoon. If you have a job for a platoon, send the whole company. This is not a subtle instrument. Supporting this core company, we have a few attachments. From the battalion, we have the Machine Gun Company HQ, leading an MG platoon with a HQ element and two Maxim teams. We also have two off-map three-tube 82mm mortar sections, each of which has 120 high explosive bombs and 18 smoke bombs available. In addition, the Soviets have a sapper platoon attached. This has three six-man squads, each of which comes with three SMGs and six satchel charges for breaching obstacles. They're led by a two-man platoon HQ. Finally, the Soviets are backed up by three Su-76M self-propelled guns. These are pretty fragile. That armor isn't going to stop AP rounds from the Pac-38 or any Panzer Shreks or Panzerfausts that connect. Plus, the back of the fighting compartment is open, so if German infantry can get an angle into the back of the vehicle, they can just shoot the crew. But they do bring 34 rounds of high explosive and a couple of smoke shells to the fight. 76mm high explosive is going to be your best way of dealing with German positions at range. That's the whole Soviet force. It's not arriving all at once. At the 5 minute mark, the 3rd Rifle Platoon, the rest of the MG Platoon and the Sappers plus the Su-76s and one mortar section will arrive. The 2nd mortar section and the MG Company HQ will follow after 10 minutes. 
So those are the forces on each side. If we mash them together with the ground and the objectives, what are the tactical elements we need to think about? It's a straightforward attack-defense scenario. The terrain is homogenous, there's no particular ground advantage to going left, right or at the middle, so this is probably going to come down to the combined arms fight. On the Soviet side, this is going to mean using the infantry to find targets for the FCU-76s to destroy, so the infantry can move forward. A good way to think about this is to split your force into three elements. A reconnaissance screen, a base of fire, and an assault element. It might seem weird, but a good candidate for the recon screen is the rifle company. In this context, the recon screen's main job is to give the Germans something to shoot at and reveal their positions. This is going to involve casualties, and there will be mines out there too, but hopefully you should be able to mitigate losses by exploiting all those nooks and crannies in the terrain and using the limited visibility to avoid getting pasted by multiple German positions in depth. Hopefully, by the five minute mark, you'll have uncovered some targets for the base of fire element. The core of this is going to be the three SU-76s. The machine guns are going to be more useful later, but they can't compete with throwing high explosive around. There are only three SU-76s though, and the Germans do have some anti-tank teeth that you really want to avoid. So don't rush them up close where they can get panzerfausted or German infantry can shoot the crew. Keep them at a distance and keep shuffling them about so that the Panzerstrecks and the Pac-38 can't dial in on the muzzle flashes and take them out. The mortars are a lot more difficult to get good effect out of. The big problem here is the call in time. That's going to be something like 10 minutes, so you really want to be on the ball and in position to kick off the call for fire process as soon as you get them. Where to call the mortars in is another question, and that's going to be linked to what your concept of the German defence is and how you want to tackle it. Those 10 minutes do, however, give you time to spot more German units, smack them around with the SU-76s, and get your assault element into position. This doesn't have to be a massive subunit. I'd be tempted to lead with the sappers because they're small teams with a lot of SMGs and demo charges for blasting through wire. Follow them up with whatever's left of the rifle company, supported by fire from the machine guns and the SU-76s. The assault element's job is the actual entering and clearing out of the objectives. This is always risky. It's worth remembering that you want to mop up German positions with fire if you can. You don't have to physically storm the trenches, but by this point you might be pushed for time. Don't forget though that if the anti-tank threat has been neutralised or reduced, you can always try and bring the SU-76s into the fight. You really want to be totally sanitising at least two objectives to deny those points to the Germans. The German defence, obviously, needs to think along a lot of the same lines from the other direction, but it also has some important choices to make. First, how much do you want to change up the default deployment? This is a solid defensive layout, but because this is a mirror match, if you leave everything where it is, your opponent is going to work that out very quickly and be able to exploit it. So seriously consider ripping up the default and starting again to keep them guessing. Second, when do you want to open fire? Opening fire earlier and at longer range is probably going to translate into fewer enemy casualties and more spotting opportunities for them to follow up with the SU-76s, but the earlier you can slow the Soviet advance down by forcing their troops to stop and take cover, the more time you're going to burn, and time is a big issue for the attacker here. On the flip side, holding fire makes it harder for the enemy to spot your positions and allows you to open up at closer range where your fire is likely to be more effective and the enemy will find it harder to escape the kill zone. But inevitably they're going to be closer to the objectives. This option is riskier but potentially decisive, especially on the anti-tank front. Third and linked, where and how do you want to fight? Digging in directly on the objectives is certainly an option and you have the fortifications, mines and terrain to have a good stab at that approach but it'll make it easier for the enemy to bring their firepower to bear. Fighting a mobile defence by falling back to successive lines could be a good way to slow the Soviet approach down and avoid staying in revealed positions waiting to get smacked by 76mm high explosive. This is much harder to pull off and moving between positions could well expose your troops to casualties you really can't afford. Fourth, 
your mortars are a tremendous asset. Using the FO and a TRP, you can call them in in two minutes, which is very fast and gives you a lot of flexibility. So keeping the FO safe and integrating the TRPs into your defense are both really important. The ideal situation is Soviet infantry pinned down by machine gun fire near a target reference point. The MGs fix them in position for the mortars to quickly destroy them. Finally, probably the biggest question, how are you going to knock out those Su-76s? Without them, the Soviet player's job gets an awful lot harder, so it's a priority. They might lose one or two to mines or bogging if you are super lucky and they are having a bad day, but realistically, it's the Pac-38 and the Panzerschrecks that are going to be doing the heavy lifting, so have a plan to use them effectively. Overall, this is a scenario that could really go either way. Remember that you're playing both sides, that to get a good score you need to do well attacking and defending, and bear in mind that your opponent might have watched this video as well. Signing up to the tournament is really easy. Go to Saved Games and PBM in the main menu, select Join Automated PBM++ Tournaments, sign in, join the tournament, and the system will pair you off against somebody and handle it all from there. One of the harder parts of playing multiplayer combat mission is finding an opponent and setting up a game. This is going to do that for you. If you're new to the game or new to multiplayer, it's a really good way to get a taste for it, and there really is nothing quite like multiplayer combat mission. If you're a veteran combat mission player and you want an opportunity to see how you measure up against the rest of the community, this is it. So sign up, get stuck in, and I'll see you in the next video.